here right away. I know that we've got people that are still joining, which is not a problem at all, um, but that way we'll be thick into it as they come in. So my name is Zeva Manvi. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions for Yale Young Global Scholars. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and a huge thank you so much to Grace at NSHSS um, and to Melissa on our team um, at YYGS. Uh, we're just really grateful to you for organizing this webinar and I'm so grateful to all of you, our participants, for being here and joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, as you can see, this is going to be a webinar that's about Yale Young Global Scholars um, and our website is up there on the screen as well, globalscholars.yale.edu. So you can feel free to navigate to that at any point during this webinar. Um, I'll certainly be referencing it as well. Um, and we'll just give a little bit of some program overview and then have a chance for questions as well. Um, again, I'm really, really grateful to the National Society of High School Scholars, NSHSS, for organizing this webinar. Uh, your organization's mission, I know, is in part inspired uh, by the mission of the Nobel Prize, which is really incredible. And for me, as someone who has spent a decade of my career um, working with college access nonprofits, helping high school students who would be first in their family to attend college, um, I'm a huge supporter of any membership organization that helps to connect students to opportunities and programs. Uh, so we're really, really grateful for all the work that uh, NSHSS does. I'm so grateful that we have the opportunity tonight to share this opportunity with you. Whether you're joining us live or viewing the recording, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, so again, uh, my name is Zeva Manvi. I'm the Associate Director of Admissions for Yale Young Global Scholars. Um, and I'm here to talk to you tonight about our opportunity that's mainly for June and July of 2021, which is our Academic Enrichment Program, YYGS Connect. Um, so before I get into that, uh, what I wanna do is launch a quick poll to learn from you all what you're most interested in hearing about during this webinar. Um, so thank you so much, Grace, for helping with that. So you can see the poll is up on your uh, Zoom controls now, uh, which is just what are you most interested in hearing about during this webinar? Um, and you can vote among general program information, if you wanna hear more about our eligibility requirements, how to apply. Uh, we can do a deep dive into the academic components of the program, our lectures, seminars, et cetera. Um, you want to hear a lot more about our tuition and need-based financial aid. That's certainly a niche for our program. Um, and or if you want to hear more about benefits of participating in YYGS, I'm happy to talk through that as well. So I'll give another couple seconds as people are voting. And then Grace, whenever you're ready, if you want to go ahead and share the results. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, great. So pretty even spread across all these things. That makes sense. Happily for all of you, we're going to be sure to talk about all of this. Um, so yeah, we'll make sure that we cover all of this and I'll make sure I put particular time towards it looks like eligibility requirements, how to apply academic components and some of the benefits of participating in YYGS and our alumni opportunities. Um, I'll note, I'm sure for many of you, you're familiar with Zoom webinars, um, that you're in listen-only mode sort of throughout the webinar. Uh, but the great thing is I do have my colleague, um, Melissa, who's on the line with us today. So if you use the questions feature of Zoom at any point during this webinar, um, you can chat questions into Melissa and she'll be able to answer them directly. Um, and we'll also have time for Q&A at the end of this webinar as well. And I'll be happy to field any of your questions then as well. And then you can always feel free to email us as well. Very similar to our website, that's just global.scholars at yale.edu. So with that, again, I'm just gonna give a little bit of program overview and information, um, and then we'll do a bit of a deeper dive. So YYGS, we are, as I noted, we are an academic enrichment program for high school students from all over the world. So that really is our niche is in global diversity and accessibility. So every summer we run in summer in the Northern Hemisphere, I should say our June and July, as I noted, um, we run academic enrichment programming that brings together students from over 130 countries around the world to participate in one of our four interdisciplinary two week sessions at Yale, whether we're on Yale's campus or as this year, as you hear me say, virtually. And I'll talk more about that as well. Um, it's really a chance to immerse yourself in a global learning community. Um, so when I talk about how students are coming from over 130 countries around the world, that includes all 50 US states, uh, it's really hard uh, to give an actual visual to that 
or what that looks like or feels like um, until you really see it or experience it. So if there you know, are 10 of us that are talking on a Zoom call and each of the 10 of us comes from a different country, and that's 10 different countries, um, that's a pretty unique experience. When you really have um, many, many students from around the world uh, coming from 130 countries, it's truly difficult to put into words. I've been in a lot of different uh, diverse environments in my time, but there is nothing like the global diversity that you find at YYGS. Um, with that, there's other things that are unique to this niche as well. So a big reason that we are two week academic enrichment summer programs and that we're not for credit is that's part of how we are so accessible to students in both the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. So in the northern hemisphere, um, for a lot of students, they are on break from school during the June and July months. But for the southern hemisphere, there's lots of students who would be in school during those sessions um, throughout June and July. The great thing about doing two week programs is that typically gives students an opportunity so that any one of those two week session offerings that we offer might be able to overlap with a break in their school session. So it's equivalent to like a winter break in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so that's a, a big part of the logistical reasoning why that makes so much sense for us to continue to be as globally accessible as we are. Um, the academic enrichment component reason for having no grades and no course credit is that this program is all about learning for the sake of learning. Uh, we really look for students who are intellectually curious um, and who are all about exploration and collaboration. So they want to dive deeper into any one or a number of academic disciplines. Um, and they are really curious and they want to set their own seminars and um, pursue knowledge for the sake of knowledge and also have that college access component as well where we can connect you as it notes there to some direct access to Yale resources. So what does it look like to be learning in an environment where you can connect to the labs, um, the libraries, um, our admissions office, like any of the different resources that are at Yale. But we're not a feeder program for Yale, so it's a common misconception um, that can occur. Um, YYGS is the official pre-college program of Yale University. Um, and so in that pre-college space, there's a range of types of programs. But with YYGS, what's unique about us is we are run by the Office of International Affairs. So we're not an admissions initiative, we're not a feeder program, we're not a revenue generator. The main focus was truly we were started by professors and others at Yale who wanted to think about what it would mean to bring together young people from around the world to address global challenges and come up with innovative solutions that might address those challenges when those students go on to become adults and leaders in their fields um, by bringing those perspectives to bear on those issues. So what I mean by that is if we're talking about an issue like access to water in sub-Saharan Africa or something, I might be able to have a really rich conversation about that issue. Um, I myself coming from rural Ohio, uh, small town Ohio, with my program director, Elena Gonzalez Blanco, who comes from Spain. And she and I could talk deeply about that, do a lot of research online, and talk about access to water in Sub-Saharan Africa. We know that conversation changes dramatically when you introduce into that conversation actual people who live or go to school in sub-Saharan Africa, as well as maybe other parts of the African continent, and maybe perspectives from something unique that's occurring around access to water in India or something as well, right? So that's the kind of, um, kind of impetus that started our YYGS mission, was thinking about how do you bring people together to address real world challenges? Um, who are really interested, again, in learning for the sake of learning. They're intellectually curious. And as it notes there, and I noted before, we're a really diverse and inclusive community. So we want to know about your interest in um, connecting with peers from all around the world um, and broadening your own worldviews as well. Whether you've traveled before, whether you've never left your hometown, um, YYGS is really a mix of students. I get this question a lot working in admissions um, and sort of what are we looking for in a student? And the two questions that I direct all of our readers to look at are, what is the student gonna contribute to YYGS and bring to the program? And what is the student gonna take away from the program or look at wanting to impact us either within themselves or in their community when the program concludes as well? So those are the kind of things that we're looking for. Um, we also have a mix of what I would call uh, round and pointy students, right? So round might be, uh, or I should say pointy, might be easier to define narrowly. Pointy would mean like, um, 
biology is my life and biology is my passion. I've known since I was born that I want to be a doctor and everything I do is focused on anatomy, biology, the path of medicine, right? So we have a lot of students in YWGS that might be that solely um, driven or focused on a particular track. Uh, those are mixed with what I would call round students where maybe I'm interested in a range of academic disciplines, um, but I've never had the chance to take a marine biology course or an oceanography course or an environmental science course. So I'm looking at the science track maybe the same way that um, the pointy person who's interested in biology is looking at, but we're coming to it with different perspectives that way. So with that, I want to make sure that you all are aware of exactly what our session offerings are for 2021. Um, so you can see that we offer three different two week session dates. Um, so that's session one, which is July 20, or sorry, June 21st to July 3rd, session two, July 5th to July 17th, and session three from July 19th to July 31st. So those are the ses three different session dates that we have, session one, session two, and session three. Then we offer these four academic tracks within each of those three dates. Um, so those four academic tracks are our STEM track, Innovations in Science and Technology, or IST, our Humanities track, Literature, Philosophy, and Culture, or LPC, our Cross-Disciplinary track, Solving Global Challenges, or SGC, and our Social Sciences track, Politics, Law, and Economics, or PLE. So when you look at our website, you will see if you go to, again, it's globalscholars.yale.edu, and you go to sessions, um, or anywhere that you see, and under YYGS Connect as well, um, and you see these listed, that's where when you see, like, um, let's say, for example, literature, philosophy, and culture, LPC, you might see LPC1, LPC2, and LPC3. That's just referring to the session dates in which it's offered. So the course itself is the same. Um, it's just you'll be with a cohort of students who's available that time as well as you. So um, again, if you're doing LPC2, that means you're doing the literature, philosophy, and culture session during session two, July 5th to July 17th. In terms of the academic components of our program, I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into each of these. But again, I wanted to give you a sense of what it looks like when you're doing a program that's academic enrichment, not for credit, and what the kinds of components that we offer are. Um, and I'll talk specifically about what this looks like when we've pivoted to online, which we've done in response to the pandemic. And I'll share a little bit more about that as well. We do offer two different session schedules to accommodate time zones all around the world online. Those are available on our website as well, globalscholars.el.edu. And if you go to YYGS Connect, you'll see sample schedules. Um, we'll have some notes about technology as well. And again, I'll come back to that after we do a sort of deep dive into these academic components. Uh, but I want to make sure that we're not burying the lead there very upfront that the program is going to be online this summer. And that was mainly critical for us to do uh, in order to maintain our global diversity when we have students coming from 130 countries around the world. So regardless of what occurs, and we really are hoping and praying along with everyone else um, for a vaccine, for things that would make it safe for us all to be able to interact and be together in person again. Um, but the odds that that would both be possible, be safe to do with bringing 130 students together to be in a dorm, and would be able to occur when we have um, embassies opening, visa requirements, etc. Um, we were really concerned about that. And so by trying to uh, navigate around that, we wanted to offer YYGS Connect online again. And I'll share a little bit about what we learned from doing YYGS Connect this past summer. Um, 2020 for students as well. So our curriculum for YYGS, as it notes there, um, is really all about, again, exploration and collaboration. So I'm going to give a short snippet summary of what these components are. So you've got in your mind what's the difference between a lecture and a seminar, for example. Um, and then I'll go in a little bit deeper about what each of these means and give you some sample ideas of what's a sample lecture, what's a sample seminar, etc. So lectures are where we have typically Yale faculty or world-renowned experts um, giving a lecture to the entire session. So if you're in, again, to my example earlier, if you're in LPC2, we are a program that's big and small at the same time. So we're typically about 200 students per session. So there might be 200 students in LPC2, um, and that'd be 200 students in that lecture. But our seminars and our other components are much much smaller, most of our academic components. It's a student to teacher ratio of about 12 to one. Um, 
And even in the lectures as well, you hear me say there's a lot of uh, opportunity for engagement. So all of our program components are live. We don't do asynchronous, it's all synchronous work where you're attending these components live, interacting, engaging um, as well. Most of the components are done via Zoom, um, either Zoom webinars or Zoom meetings, uh, mostly Zoom meetings um, where you can mute, unmute, and be talking and conversing with one another in the chat, et cetera. And then we use Canvas for our academic uh, curriculum components where you might have a required reading or something like that, right? So with all of that in mind, uh, coming back from the numbers to what these components are, lectures are where we, again, we have Yale faculty, or world-renowned experts around the world, um, giving a lecture um, specially designed for YYGS to all of you. Um, it's typically about something that the lecturer is really passionate about. Um, so we have had lectures um, from our uh, professors here at Yale, that might be like John Kerry, um, our former Secretary of State and presidential uh, nominee. We've had uh, the guy who discovered the Higgs boson particle, really an incredible range of people um, who have lectured with YYGS. Um, and they would give, again, a full lecture. It's typically about an hour to an hour and a half um, of a lecture that includes about 30 minutes at the end that is just for live Q&A with you, the audience. So you would have, again, um, either access to questions like you do in this webinar where you're typing them, but more often than not, um, you have the ability to use the raise hand feature and then be called on, unmute, and converse directly with the lecturer. That's really common. Um, so we have our lectures. We have breakout sessions, which is typically where you are debriefing in a smaller group, again, 10 to 12 students maybe, um, what you learned in the lecture. So that's a chance to do a little bit of a deeper dive. We really want you to dissect these lectures. So it's not about like, what did you learn? Write it down, report out. No, we want you to think about, did you agree with the lecture? Did you disagree? Do you think the lecture could have been better? What topics do you wish they'd covered? Like really kind of wrestle with um, the issues and things that were brought up either during the lecture, during the Q&A, when you did a reading for the lecture, anything like that. And it's really a facilitated discussion. So there's not a uh, set syllabus for that or something. Uh, we typically have a Yale, current Yale undergraduate or graduate student who's acting as an instructor that's facilitating that discussion. Um, but they are um, just working with you all to kind of ask guiding questions to help with that. So then after our lectures and breakout sessions, um, you also have seminars. So seminars, again, I'll give some sample ones as well. That's where those under current Yale undergraduate and graduate students, um, they're typically either a one-off seminar where it's in one day, here's a seminar. It's about, um, you know, black feminisms around the world, something like that, right? Um, or it might be over multiple days. Sometimes that happens in our LPC uh, program in particular. So that can occur because uh, maybe there is a reading or a text or a film or something that might take a little bit more time to read or to get through or to work through. Um, so typically one day or maybe over two days, uh, something like that, seminars. Family time, that refers to actually your YYGS family. So when we're on campus, um, that can, you know, is very obvious. You're clearly not with your family at home, right? You're with a group of students getting to know them better. Um, we do a lot of things with identity reflection. It's also just a time to socialize as well. You might play a game. Um, there's all kinds of things. Our, uh, both our students, I have to say, and our instructors are extremely creative and that's been one of the single best and biggest feedbacks that we've gotten from doing YYGS Connect is it doesn't feel like online school because it's not. You're not taking tests, you're not taking quizzes, you're not doing homework for a grade, nothing like that. It's really about showing up, um, being present in these conversations and being open to these cross-cultural um, deep dives into real world challenges around the world. Um, so that's a lot of what's happening in lectures, breakout sessions, seminars, family time. Our capstone project is kind of connected when we go online to simulation that it notes there. So simulation is sometimes if you're familiar with Model UN, that might be one way to think about it, uh, sort of related to that. But it's thinking about, um, again, how do you take a real world challenge and work with a team uh, to come up with a solution for it that you're researching over the course of two weeks. So it's sort of a two week research project um, and the capstone of it is sort of the simulation finale presentation. That's a lot of what happens online. Um, our impact panel, as it notes there, that's really, really cool. Uh, the last year that I saw that was, was pretty amazing. That is typically YYGS alumni and some other experts from um, community-based organizations, CBOs, NGOs, 
uh, nonprofits who are talking about how they themselves um, started or were part of a movement um, to have real impact after their time at YYGS. So we um, heard from um, some people on the impact panel who had worked with refugees, who had worked with people in North Korea, um, Syrian refugees specifically, who had done work um, with first generation students. So it's pretty cool to see how people sort of take the ideas that they've had in YYGS or in similar kinds of programs or from their own life experience and turn that into action. And we wanna be able to share that with all of you and again, give you a chance to have, interact with them, ask questions. Um, it's a really dynamic panel that, panel that way. And then for our opportunities across Yale or OAY, I know I mentioned that before, um, that's really a chance to get access to Yale resources, but specifically so that you have a sense of what those resources look like at any college or university around the world. So sometimes that's talking about things like time management or organization. More often than not, it's looking at what are those actual resources. Again, how are you using a research library on a college campus? Um, what do the labs look like on a college campus? Giving you that experience. Um, and those departments have been extremely generous with us with YYGS and we have long-standing relationships with them and they're happy to share resources with all of you. Um, as it noted on the last slide, we do give a certificate of completion for successfully completing any of our two-week sessions with YYGS, which is basically a downloadable PDF. And you can upload that into your college or university application around the world. Uh, YYGS is an internationally recognized credential. I've been doing this for uh, about three years now um, with all of our admissions for YYGS. And I love talking with admissions officers everywhere. They love um, students that have had YYGS experience, um, in particular, again, because they know that they're critical thinkers who have really um, worked with students who they've never met before from around the world to grapple with deep questions. So to do a deeper dive into some of those components that I just mentioned, I talked about lectures. Um, you can see there from when we were on campus, that was a lecture in the Yale Law School. Um, and then also what that looks like on Zoom as well. So you can see that um, the lecturer is sort of on a live Zoom meeting. The students there can unmute, ask, raise hands and ask questions. They're in the chat as well. Um, so it's, it's a pretty cool time. But what I like about the chats with the lectures as well, sometimes students are talking with each other about what they heard then. Um, so that can happen there. That can also happen in Canvas ahead of the breakout discussions. There's a lot of ways um, that that occurs. And I have really loved um, being able to attend the lectures for YYGS, um, especially around the pandemic, the fact that they are so current events driven. So a lot of the lectures I saw in our politics, law and economics course, for example, were on the economics of what was happening with the impact of the COVID-19 crisis and pandemic around the world. Um, so they're very current, very cutting edge, and uh, it's really incredible to get access to these uh, renowned researchers who are often, usually we um, sometimes can't film our lectures or we can't record them or share them publicly because the research is private and ongoing currently before it's been published. So that's pretty incredible access um, for all of us to have. You can see uh, a broader um, set there of some sample lectures. We do have a ton of lectures across um, all of those sessions you can imagine. Um, you can see there between Anika Obiocha, Daniel Prober, Miriam Chertow, David Bach, um, some really, really incredible lectures there. I know um, Oni or Onika is there, um, was one of my favorite lectures last year where he was really talking about values and how they change over time related to social entrepreneurship was pretty incredible um, and it was one of those things that i was like wow i wish i had heard more about this and how values that you can think you sort of hold deeply entrenched um, change and fluctuate as you're starting a business and working to give back to community over time it was pretty fascinating breakout sessions we mentioned that as well that that's sort of digging deeper into the content of the lecture with a small group of peers. And I, I know I talked about that at length, so I won't dwell on it here. I do wanna be able to leave this slide up for a second because it has some sample seminars. So as I noted before, um, seminars are really where um, we want students to be able to be their own driver and kind of pursue their passion as they choose among a large blue book of seminars. So what happens is you receive, and this is always true whether we're on campus or uh, online, you receive ahead of time a digital blue book for your session of all the seminars that will be offered then. Um, and then you're able to rank 
um, preferences among, you know, like say three seminars, six seminars, something like that, um, depending on the length of the program and which program you're in, whether they're one day seminars or maybe a two day seminar. Um, but you are able to rank your preferences and we take that really, really seriously um, going off of what is it that you're interested in learning more about. So if there's a program like politics, law, and economics, or innovations in science and technology. Those are usefully broad terms where maybe your main interest is astrophysics specifically or it's economics specifically, um, and you want to deeply dive into that. Or in literature, philosophy, and culture, it's philosophy, right? So you could choose seminars that match to your particular or specific interest there. Um, the seminars are extremely creative, again, typically from Yale undergraduate and graduate students, often who are doing their own research on these kinds of topics. Um, and they're extremely, they're clever, they're creative, they're dynamic. I remember one of my favorite ones from last summer was called like, is my refrigerator spying on me? And it was talking about technology and um, what are legal implications of some of the different kinds of smart devices that are happening in our homes. Something to think about particularly now that a lot of us are home around quarantine a lot, um, but it's, it's a pretty fascinating range of um, seminar topics that we really want students to be able to choose among um, to kind of design the kind of YYGS curriculum that works for them. And then family time, as I noted before, where we're really fostering relationships with peers around the world. Um, family time is one of our most popular components from last year's YYGS Connect session. Um, I think the chance to be able to sort of talk socially engage um, with students, learn about their home communities. Um, there are the sort of, uh, one student put it to me as there's the accidental intimacies that occur on Zoom that there's even more space for in YYGS than there may be in your school. So what happens when you're all, you know, you're doing a discussion of let's say eight of you um, and then someone's cat walks by and another person's younger brother is going by behind them or something, right? The things that happen that cause you to get to know each other um, your home communities, et cetera, I think is very real in Zoom. Um, and also to talk about what you might be currently going through in that moment. You know, there's sort of a global trauma that's happening around this pandemic that we're really sensitive to. And so family time is always a chance to be able to think about your own identity, how that shifts over time, or maybe currently shifting, um, how you understand yourself and others. Um, but it's also a chance to think about your home, where you are attending from at that moment, from some students that are calling in from where they are in school or in a boarding school. Others are with family, others maybe somewhere else entirely. It's, it's a range around the world. And um, family time, I think this, the light social element of it combined with sort of the deep dive that naturally or organically occurs um, between, again, our undergraduate and graduate instructors and um, your peers, and it's, it's really your peers that make this program what it is. Um, it's one of my favorite things about YYGS is it's so student driven. So our staff works really hard year round to put this program together and make sure that these, especially when we're online, like live components are dynamic, engaging, fun, exciting, academically challenging and interesting. Um, but it's all of you coming from around the world that really drive um, how incredible and how innovative this program can be. Uh, we have every summer, for example, I know uh, Melissa, my colleague who's in the uh, questions doing the Q&A, um, she works with our media team so that students can apply after they've been admitted to YWGS to be on our media team. And we have things like a videographer or someone who's running our Instagram. Like we really let students kind of take it over while we're in session with YYGS. And even outside of that, if you look on our Instagram now, you can also see a lot of our student takeovers, things like that. We really think that you all give the best voice to YYGS. I can talk about it and I will and all the things that I've experienced from running it, um, but I want you to hear from students themselves. What do they like about it? What was challenging? What would they do differently? Um, and if you go to our website, again, globalscholars.yale.edu, and you go to the how to apply section, there's a section called Info Sessions where you can see our recorded webinars. Um, they were live webinars. We still have some coming up, including this Saturday. I should say Melissa's hosting one with a range of our alumni. Um, but you could also see if you missed that one or if you're tuning into the recording of this, a range of recorded webinars as well, every single one of which features different YYGS alumni um, talking personally about their own experience. They don't have a script. Um, we just want them to share exactly what they felt this program was. Um, we have a really incredible uh, group of nearly 10,000 YYGS alumni around the world um, who are actively engaged as our alumni ambassadors, and that's something that they volunteer to do. 
um, both because they want to be involved. It's something they know they can put on a resume as well. Um, you can see them featured on our website as well in the alumni tab. Um, so, so for all of these reasons, what I'm trying to get across is that between family time and just how you get to know us and this program in such a personal and live way, that's a big part of, I think, why students feel such a deep connection to what's a two-week academic enrichment program. So I noted before I explained a little bit more about our capstone project, our impact panel simulation opportunities across Yale. So I won't talk too much about that here, and I do want to make sure that we have plenty of time for Q&A as well. Um, but that just gives you a little bit of summary of each of those program components um, and what those look like in particular when we're online. I mentioned that I would talk a little bit more about why we had decided to pivot to being online for 2021 YYGS Connect. Um, and you can see that in summary on your screen now. So as it notes there, the number one reason is clearly that our top priority is protecting the health and safety of our students and staff. So your well-being is the most important thing to us. So we would need to know no matter what um, that we could do this safely. Um, and also enjoyably. So that's important to us too. You know, we don't want to promise you a fun, dynamic, engaging academic enrichment program on campus. And then when you get here, we're like, just kidding. You're in a dorm room. Don't come out. Meals will be delivered to you. You won't actually see anyone else, but you'll be attending from a computer there, right? We don't want to do any kind of bait and switch there. We want to have really open communication with you and make sure you know that, hey, when it's safe to be on campus again, we will return to being back on campus, but we're going to do it when you can dynamically actually experience the campus. That's really critical for us. Global diversity, I mentioned, we know that regardless of the safety concern, um, the travel restrictions that can limit access to on-campus programs are very real. There are several countries that have already announced closed borders through the rest of 2021. You can believe it that early that we've been tracking. So we don't want to run this program on campus, on uh, Yale's campus in Connecticut, if it's only going to be a program for students from Connecticut, right? Um, or from Connecticut plus two other states. YYGS only works when we have our entire global diversity, our whole range of countries possible. Um, and we don't want to exclude anyone. We want everyone to be able to be there live um, and be attending and communicating together. So that's a big reason that um, we originally had anticipated, okay, we can make a decision about whether we'll be on campus or online, maybe in March, something like that. Um, but once we recognize that like, hey, we have a high demand uh, for this program from students. Annually, YYGS receives a little over 7,000 applications for this program. Um, and so because of that, we typically open our application a little bit earlier than most other pre-college programs. We open it in about mid-September. Then we have an early action deadline, which is passed now, that's about November 15th, and a regular decision deadline that is January 12th. Then we're making decisions and releasing them by March 5th. And we do that typically because we need to have students having enough time to get a travel visa, to put plans in place to be able to be here. So the moment that we realize, listen, like we can run that whole timeline and we could technically wait to announce a decision. Um, if we know in our clear, you know, transparent communication that we're gonna have to go online and we can tell that now, given the travel restrictions, the safety concerns, how new everything will be come June and July of 2021. And again, we hope we can do things safely then, um, but it's, it's too new for us to be able to guarantee that. Um, and to know that again, embassies would be open in such a way that we all could connect safely uh, together. So for all those reasons, we wanted to, as it notes there, transparency, be open and honest with our students, our families, our educators. Um, we shared this update in October that we were going online. So we actually shared it before the early action deadline. Um, and I should note that if you're curious about the balance between early action and regular decision, we do have spots available in both uh, applicant pools. There's financial aid available in both pools. I'll talk a little bit more about that. We do have a whole webinar that's up about choosing the deadline that's right for you. So anyone who's applying from now going forward uh, between now and our regular decision deadline will be regular decision between now and January 12th. Um, but rest assured that there is going to be over a thousand spots available and plenty of financial aid as well. So we really do encourage you to apply. Uh, and in this effort, we want you to know that what you're applying for is our online 2021 YYGS Connect program. The other thing I want to say about this in the interest of transparency is I'm a big data person. You might have guessed that with all the numbers that are often rattling or that I'm um, 
giving you off the top of my head. Uh, and I'm always happy to share those openly and transparently as well. So if you ever have any questions about that, you can always email us at global.scholars.el.edu. I'll share here everything that I know of that as well. I know I mentioned that annually we have about a little over 7,000 applications coming. Um, you saw before that we have 12 session offerings. So those three tracks, uh, or so the, those three session dates and four different tracks about 200 students per session, so about 2,400 spots. Um, and I can share that last year we had about a 93% yield rate, so that's out of everyone who was offered admission, how many people accepted our offer of admission. Um, and I'll also be able to give some numbers about financial aid coming up as well, which is something we're really proud of and I would encourage you to ask other programs about as well. So for YYGS, annually we have over a third of all of our participants are on some form of need-based financial aid from us. Um, and I'll share exactly what that looks like. Um, and we're really unique in that we are one of the only programs we know of that offers exactly equal need-based financial aid to both domestic and international students. So that's a big way that we're um, as globally available as well. So I know I mentioned I'll talk about our tuition costs as well coming up, but I do want to note that up front, when we pivoted to online, we did reduce the cost to adjust for not having room and board, things like that. Um, but we do still have significant program costs because we run a live program that involves all of our year-round staff, hiring the instructors, working with lecturers, paying for the technology platforms. So there's things like that where there is still a cost to it, but we're trying to um, maintain our need-based financial aid at exactly the same level um, to make sure that this program is as accessible as possible. And again, I'll, I'll dive kind of deeply into that in a moment. What I want to talk about now with us going online is what our sample schedules look like. So I don't expect you to necessarily be able to see this deeply or well, particularly if you're joining on a phone or uh, maybe it's a little bit small or blurry on your computer screen. But I want you to know that these sample schedules are up on our website. So again, uh, globalscholars.yale.edu. If you go to YYGS Connect in the upper right corner, you would see where it says sample schedules. And this is exactly what you see as our two sample schedules. So this again is to accommodate time zones around the world. So we have an AM schedule, which refers to the morning at Yale or Eastern Daylight Time, EDT, that's just what it is in June and July. Um, and we wanna give you what those times are, as you can see both in terms of like an AM, PM, uh, break down like, you know, 8 AM to 9.30 AM, right? Something like that. Um, also in military time, so, you know, from 1300 to 1500, right? Something like that. So I wanna try to make it as clear as possible because we know people do time and dates all differently around the world. But you can see what it looks like for our AM schedule and those offerings, and also for our PM schedule or the evening at Yale and those offerings. So what happens is you end up doing lectures together. So you'll notice that the lectures that 11 to 12 30 PM time is the same across both schedules. And for the AM schedule, you've got components that are happening or morning at Yale ahead of that time or before that. And for the PM schedule, you've got components that are happening after that time. Um, so those are some things to be aware of there. Um, you might also note if you're eagle eyed that it mentions in those schedules uh, another opportunity that I didn't talk about before, which was special meals. So that's a holdover from when we were on campus that we're really excited um, to be offering this June and July as well. Uh, where it doesn't mean we can't unfortunately deliver a meal to you where you are around the world. What we can do is all kind of break bread together. So special meals are elective, they're optional. Um, it's where we can um, talk about um, what does it mean to be LGBTQ plus on a college campus, et cetera. So it's elective options um, to have sort of lunchtime discussions, let's say. Um, lunchtime, if you were at Yale, could be anytime, dinner, breakfast, et cetera, around the world, um, where you can come together and talk about um, other issues outside of just our standard curriculum that are offered by both of our staff, but also our instructors as well. So it's really a range of special meal options that we have. Um, sometimes a student might propose a special meal. Um, sometimes it's a chance to do a smaller discussion with the lecturer that was featured that day. So we've got kind of a range of those, um, but you'll see those are in the sort of optional spaces um, in both of the schedules as well. So I just wanna make sure, again, I don't expect you to be like screenshotting or deeply staring at this. It's more if you go to our website, I wanna make sure that you're aware that these schedules exist. It's PDF, um, you can view it in your browser there or be able to download it and view it that way. And then what we're expecting you're doing is looking at sort of time zone equivalents 
from what, what those YYGS Connect schedules are to where you would be attending from. So as it notes there, if you're looking at what time does the lecture begin, we know the lectures are combined from 11 to 12.30. So if the lecture begins here on Yale's campus um, at 11 a.m. EDT or 1100, um, that would mean it's beginning at 8 a.m. in Los Angeles, at 4 p.m. in London, at 5 p.m. in Cape Town, 6 p.m. in Moscow, and 11 p.m. in Beijing, right? So what you want to do is think about, again, what is the time difference and the equivalent? And then in your YYGS application, you're able to do a couple of things around your session preferences. First, you could rank up to all four of those topic preferences. So um, you could say, you know, I'm my first choice is LPC, my second choice is PLE, my third choice is SGC, and my fourth choice is IFC. That's one option. Um, you could also say, I only want one choice, like I'm only interested in LPC. So that's my first choice, that's it. Or you could rank only two. I would do either LPC or SGC. Those are my only two ranks. So you can rank among your topics. Then it's going to ask among the session dates, which of those are you available? And that's a check all that applies. So I'm available sessions one, two, and three. Or I'm only available, available sessions two and three, something like that. And if you note that you're available for more than one of those sessions, it's going to ask what your first choice preference is of that. So if I say I'm only available sessions two and three, then it'll say, what's your first choice? I might say, well, my first choice preference would be session two, um, because I'm not sure if session three will overlap with a family vacation or something, making that up, um, or another, you know, academic commitment. It's very common for students to combine YYGS Connect with another program, with a summer job, um, with experiences with your family, maybe there's a, a virtual wedding or something you're attending, right? Uh, that's really common because it's a two-week program, so it's really designed to be able to accommodate whether you're also in school during that session, you've got another program, etc. Um, so what you're trying to do is see, hey, when am I available? What topics am I interested in? And then, as it noted there, we do have an AM schedule and a PM schedule, which you can view again on our website. And it's going to ask you, which is your preference? And you can either say, my preference is the AM schedule, my preference is the PM schedule, or I don't care, place me in either. Like, I'm good to go with either of those times with where I am. That would be fine. Um, so we want to make sure that Chris is clear on sort of what that looks like in terms of how to apply. Um, and this is my last slide, so I'll give a little bit more information just about that application process. So our application is open now, as it notes. If you go to globalscholars.yale.edu and you go to uh, the How to Apply tab, you'll see there's an Apply Now. It's where you can create. It's an online application entirely. Um, you don't have to do the application all in one sitting. So we do give a preview application tab where you can actually download a PDF of the application if you want to, like, look at an essay prompt ahead of time or things like that's totally fine. Uh, but if you want to just go ahead and open it and create an application, uh, as I noted before, it does save as you go. So um, typically how that's working, it'll time out on a page if you're on it forever, but if you're on a page of the application and you click continue to the next page or you use the left-hand menu to sort of navigate among different pages of the application, um, that's how it will sort of save each time that you do that and then you can return to it. Um, the components of the application itself that we're asking for, we want to give good practice for a college application, and yet we don't want it to be overkill uh, related to your applying to a two-week academic enrichment program. Um, so to balance that, we'll ask you questions like about your, um, how do you spend your time outside of school, so your activities, but we don't need a giant list of ex extracurriculars, right? We just actually want to know about up to three activities that are the most meaningful to you. So we're going to ask you, what's the most meaningful activity you do? And then you could choose to do up to two more if you want, but that's optional. And those could be what you might think of as typical extracurriculars if you're in the US, for example, like sports or volunteering or things like that. But a lot of times that's things like family responsibilities, maybe especially around the pandemic, you're babysitting a younger sibling, could be working a part-time job. Any of those things count as activities that are sort of outside of school. So we're going to ask about your activities. We're going to ask for a transcript. You have the option there to do what's called an official transcript, uh, where you're giving us contact information for an official at your school, and then we'll send them a unique link where they can upload a transcript. Or um, you can also upload an unofficial transcript. So an official transcript is anything that comes directly from the school to us. An unofficial transcript is anything that you self-upload, which you can do easily into the application. We'll ask for two recommendations, so recommenders, I should say. What that means is, again, you'll give us contact information 
um, for people who could give you a recommendation, like an, a name and email address, we email them a unique link and then they're doing one of our recommendation forms. So we don't accept letters of recommendation. Um, we only accept that unique link where the recommender is completing. It's about five multiple choice questions and they have an option to write some qualitative response or feedback about you as well. Uh, it's very quick. We know we've got um, educators and schools all around the world um, that are accessing that. And so we want to make sure that it's not uh, onerous for them to complete, um, but can still give us really deep and rich information about you. So a transcript, two recommendations, um, talking a little bit about your activities, a little bit about you, your personal backgrounds. So you can just say, um, for, it's really common for a lot of our students uh, if you have a primary citizenship and or a secondary citizenship, where you go to school, um, those kind of things. And then we basically ask for our essay section is one essay, two what are called fast takes. So those are kind of like the size of a tweet. So that would be something like um, one of our, again, you can see all these in our preview application. One of our fast takes this year is asking about um, if you could have a conversation with any fictional character from a book, a film, comic book, et cetera, um, what character would you pick and what would you talk about with them? Again, size of a tweet. So um, you might say Harry Potter and we would discuss, you know, um, what did his development look like over the course of the seven books? Making that up. Um, but if there is, again, any, anything like that, it's sort of a quick fast take. So we've got one essay, two fast takes, and then one short answer. The essay, as it notes there, is going to ask you about um, stereotypes. So what's a stereotype that you think uh, someone might have about you? And how does that compare to your own view of yourself? Um, why do you think that they might have that? What's the research or any basis for that? Um, the short answer is going to ask you about your values. So what's something that shaped you? Um, and that we get a whole range of answers there. There's no right answer. It's more about like it could be it's your grandmother, it's a figure skating, it's anything again that sort of shaped values and, and your personality and your character. Um, so the goal again of all these questions is not a right answer, wrong answer thing. We really want to get to know more about you, your personality, your character, what drives you, what's of interest to you, what are you hoping to bring to YYGS. So that's what happens through that essay section. Then we end with an additional info section where we're just going to ask about um, some optional questions around like languages you speak, um, ethnicity or demographic questions, um, your access, so internet access, et cetera, um, to see where we might be able to help with that uh, and all of those things. And then the last piece I want to note that's really, really important is our need-based financial aid. And then I'm going to shift to questions. So I mentioned before that we have really, really generous need-based financial aid. It's, you heard me say at the beginning, I've worked with college access nonprofits for the last 10 years. So it's a huge part of the reason I came to YYGS was making sure that this program was all about expanding uh, its ability to serve students who would be first in their family to go to college from anywhere around the world. So the way that we do that with YYGS is the financial aid application is open to everyone who applies to YYGS. So there's not like a minimum, you know, family income or a maximum family income, et cetera, to be able to apply. No, we support low income students, middle income students, everyone across a range of financial backgrounds. And what occurs is if you're uh, interested in or you have a need for need-based financial aid because there it would be a barrier and any kind of economic hardship for you to attend YYGS due to cost, um, then within the application, it's going to ask, do you want to apply for a need-based financial aid, yes or no? If you say no, that's okay, but that's the last opportunity you have to apply for financial aid. If you say yes, uh, what happens is it's going to ask you for some documentation, uh, but we try to make it as easy as possible where basically we've got four different types of documentation that you can provide, a tax return, a bank statement, um, employment statement, et cetera, um, or any other proof of income. Um, and you could choose just one of those four. So for students in the US, that might be just a federal tax return, something like that. Then you can give a statement of need um, where you can just explain. And this is a part of the application, the financial aid part, where you're welcome to have a parent or guardian help you with this portion of the application. That's completely acceptable. Um, like they could write your statement of need, for example, that would be completely fine. Um, where they can share a little bit more about your family's financial situation and. Uh, make sure that we're crystal clear on that. And then it's going to ask you about expected family contribution. So that's your EFC. So that's really preparing for college and that terminology, which is saying, what reasonably do you think that your family could contribute towards the 3,500? 
don't worry, we don't hold you to it. We're not like, and that's the amount of it. We just want to know, like, from your perspective, what's going on with your financial situation and what you all are thinking you can reasonably contribute to this program. That could be impacted by those technology issues. So maybe you say, hey, like, I'm going to need a Wi-Fi hotspot or I'm going to need to get a tablet to be able to do this program uh, during the summer. So if I factor in the cost for that, then that would reduce the amount that my family could pay towards tuition, something like that. So those are the kinds of transparency that we're trying to communicate with you that we want from you to us to make sure we can help you do this program. And then what occurs is two things. One, we're nearly need blind with regard to need-based financial aid. I'm really proud of that. So our readers, when they are reading YYJS applications, are not able to see the financial aid portion of your application at all. We literally hide it in the platform and technology. So when a reader is reading your application and thinking about whether we should be giving you an offer of admit, waitlist, or deny, they can't see whether or not you're requesting financial aid at all. They can't even see your answer to any of those questions. Um, if they mark you as slated to be um, offered an, an offer of admission, then a financial aid reader, so a totally separate reader, looks specifically at your financial aid documentation to try to say, hey, what's the most amount that we can give to meet your need? So the reason I can't say that we're fully need blind is fully need blind. What that means typically for a school or college or university is that they're committing to meet your full amount of need no matter what, no loans, et cetera. So we have no loans, none of that's part of our package. We're just giving tuition discounts. Um, but I can't commit that we could fully meet your need. We tried to. So if we determined that out of $3,500 of our YYGS tuition, that your family could reasonably pay, let's say $1,500, right? So we would need to give you $2,000 of discount um, for you to be able to attend. If I say, okay, well, I can't actually, I don't have the budget to be able to give you $2,000, but I can give you $1,500. Um, so that's a difference for your family of could you pay $1,500 to do the program or $2,000, and that's gonna be a decision for you all to be able to make when you're applying. But what happens because you do the financial aid application as part of your application, what that means is when, if and when we release an offer of admission to you, it includes that financial aid package. So you're accepting or declining our offer of admission, knowing exactly what your financial aid would be um, and before you're having to pay anything. Um, so that's really important to us. And then as I noted, the last thing I'll say with that is the way that it's happening is an intuition discount. So our smallest amount of discount uh, for YYGS Connect is $250. So we could say, hey, okay, you only have a little bit of need that you're demonstrating even that you're asking for. Uh, we could be able to give you a $250 off of this tuition price. Um, and then it goes in increments of 500, like 500, 1,000, 1,500, et cetera, all the way up to the full 3,500. So it is possible that we could say, oh, okay, your family has deep, significant financial need. You've given us a lot of documentation for that. Um, so we're willing to cover the whole 3,500 and the cost to you to do this program would be zero. Um, so that is how our financial aid works. Um, it's part of the reason that our program is as accessible we are, because again, we're doing that equally for domestic and international students. We don't have a cap or a limit on it in terms of number. It's really about budget for us. And annually, we've been distributing a little over $3 million uh, US dollars in need-based financial aid. And again, over a third of our participants are on aid. Last year, our average aid package covered about 80% of the cost of tuition. So if you're looking at this program and thinking that this might be a barrier for you, or you have friends that are interested in attending, but your board might be a barrier for them, that's something we want to make clear as well, is that YYGS is meant to be a program for truly all people from all backgrounds, all walks of life, um, to be able to attend and to join us. So with that, I want to look at some of your questions. I know you've been active there, and I really appreciate um, Melissa in the chat helping with those and if you have any questions now from anything you've heard you can feel free to type those in as well. Um, yes yeah, so I can see that we had some questions about um, international students being able to participate which as you heard massively they are and we really encourage that. Um, Okay, yeah, and then we had a question that I appreciate that about the, um, what's the chance of being admitted. So as Melissa noted there, we have about, um, as I know, a little over 7,000 applications we're receiving every year, and we have about 2,400 spots, and last year we had about a 93% yield rate. Um, so you can see where it's competitive, it, it is, um, but we encourage everyone to apply. We don't have like a minimum GPA requirement. The other thing I should note is that we do not take any standardized tests. Um, so we don't accept an ACT and SAT and um, APs, none of that. Um, 
The reason for that is because the data around a lot of those tests supports that they can be extremely discriminatory um, and really a barrier and not actually measuring many things that are useful regarding your academic ability. Um, so the only standardized test that we offer as an option, and it's completely optional, are English fluency tests. So if you, you have the option, if you'd like to upload a TOEFL or a Duolingo score, um, anything like that, we have those all listed on our website. Uh, again, not required. We encourage it, you to consider it if your school is in a language or a medium that's other than English, because we are a rigorous curriculum conducted in English. Uh, but it's absolutely not required. Um, so that's, that's the only optional standardized test score that we would take. Uh, but aside from that, we really want to hear about you and your academic journey. So it doesn't need to look like 4.0, you know, grade point average and perfect test scores across, you know, we want to, we care about you. What is your interest in learning? What's your background? What's your passion for this program? And, and why do you want to be a part of YYGS specifically? We hope that you're applying to multiple academic enrichment programs. Truly, they're competitive. So if you aren't able to do a program with us, I'm hoping that you are able to do a program with any of our peers at Brown, Stanford, et cetera. Um, but if you're choosing to apply for us in our application, we're going to ask why us? What makes you interested in our program? Yep, and then I see questions around um, extracurriculars, which I know I mentioned before, so it can be a whole range of things. Don't need to, you know, really the maximum number you can put there is three. Um, so it's about why you do the extracurriculars that you do and your description of that, more so than a quantitative number of those. Um, that's really important. And I can see some questions about costs. I know I just uh, discussed that, so that our full tuition price is $3,500. So we were $6,500 when we were on campus. We reduced that cost to $3,500 when we're online to account for the difference in room and board. That's significant. Um, and it's helpful, I think, to really understand that related to college tuition as well, where there's a sticker price that can seem high if you've got financial barriers in particular, although it's lower than our cost per student to run the program. Uh, but then we're giving um, financial aid. There's sort of the price of tuition, there's your expected family contribution, there's a gap between, and then we're filling that gap with financial aid. So that's typically how that works. So I see a question about transcripts. It's a really good one about how many classes on a transcript do you need to submit. So we, I also wanna note that we are really understanding around all the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on transcripts recommendations, right? We, we totally get that. It can be much more difficult this year to secure those than other years. Um, so for a transcript, what we're looking at specifically is we want to know the grades, or sorry, the courses and the grades that you've received since basically U.S. grade nine or international equivalent up until now. Um, so any of those that you've got, we're interested in. And then currently, the current courses you're taking, we just want to know what you're enrolled in. We don't need to see grades or midterms or anything like that if you don't have them yet. Um, and again, we're really understanding on the impact of COVID-19 if any of those shifted from letter grades to pass fail or your international. I mean, listen, we're working with high schools truly from around the world. I think last year we had like over 900 high schools, different high schools represented. Um, so we've seen all measure of system um, and those transcripts can be submitted in your native language. They don't have to be translated into English. Um, our readers are trained to do it across. You, you, Truly would be impressed with that. Um, and then again, what we want to see is what are the courses that you've taken and the grades that you've had just since grade nine up until now. Sometimes that looks like multiple transcripts and sometimes it's one transcript covering all of it. And we know in our application too how that works um, if you have attended multiple schools, for example, in high school, that's, that's really common and, and we can help with that too. Um, so the last thing I'll say is we've got our last minute here. Again, feel free if you do have questions, you can keep typing them in and we'll keep checking them out. Um, but you also, anything that we don't get to, um, you can also email us as it notes there, global.scholars at yale.edu. Um, we don't have any bots or automated responders or anything. It is our staff. It's me, Melissa, Tina, Jess, et cetera. We are answering your questions there. And we're more than happy to. So if we don't get to your question here, please feel free to ask it there. Um, and around eligibility, I just wanted to note um, that typically the way it works for YWGS is we're working with students who are typically, yeah, I see the question about age. So our students are typically 16 to 17 years old when they're participating in the program. So usually we want students to have had at least one complete year of high school prior to applying. So you've completed your freshman year of high school and then you're applying. 
Um, so you're either a high school sophomore or you're a junior when you're applying. And then we want you to have some amount of school left after the program concludes. So if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you might have a full year, like your senior year, you know, so you participate in either your sophomore or junior year, the summer after that, then you have your whole senior year afterwards. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, you might only have like a semester left, right? So you participate in the program in June or July, and then um, you graduate that following December, something like that. So that would be completely fine uh, that way. So we're looking again at 16 to 17 years old and that you're graduating from high school at some point after the program. Um, and then again, your English fluency, the main thing for us is just that it's strong enough that you can participate in a rigorous curriculum conducted in English. Um, so that's where we don't want to do a disservice to you. We're not an English language learning program. We are not set up to help if um, you need support and like improving or strengthening your English, but we want to connect you to programs that do. And it's really common for students to do a program that might help with um, strengthening their English and then come and do why would you ask either one. But if your English is anywhere close to strong enough that you're, for example, in school in English or um, you know you could do a program like us, we encourage you to apply um, and that would be great. And again, we, we don't require English fluency scores. It's just an option of something you can add to your application. And yes, you can definitely apply to more than one program. Uh, I see that question coming in. So we talk about this in our early action and regular decision webinar. I want people to be familiar with those terms, but uh, we are not restricted non-binding early action for the students that applied early action. Um, and our regular decision is not binding either. So what that means is you can apply to as many programs as you like. And then we're typically releasing decisions. You can see that on our deadlines page on our website. So if you go to globalscholars.el.edu, how to apply and click deadlines. Uh, we can see that we've committed to releasing uh, decisions for regular decision by the first week of March. Um, and then you would have time after that to do your, what's called your admission reply forum. So accept or decline your offer of admission and then to pay your tuition amount. And again, you would know what your financial aid package was if you had financial aid or to pay the $3,500 if it was full tuition. And then after, it's after that time. So you're doing that in let's say March, April. Um, we do do some waitlist polls, things like that around that time if we still have some open spots. Um, and then typically around May, maybe April, May, you might be looking at your blue book and filling out seminar preferences and then you're participating in the program either June or July. Awesome, so I think that answers uh, the questions. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I know that we have about an hour slated for this. So again, I just wanna give a huge, huge thank you to Grace and to all of you um, from the National Society of High School Scholars, NSHSS. Thank you so much for hosting us and letting us share a little bit more about our opportunity and why would just connect specifically. Um, huge thanks um, for, uh, to Melissa for everything you're doing in the chat and the Q&A. Um, and then yeah, please feel free to again, email any questions we didn't get to. As I noted before, and I'll say again, if you're concerned about anything related to the pandemic, you might not be able to get a recommendation or you don't think your counselor is going to be able to get your transcript in, we have ways to help you. So those are not entirely necessary. We can make sure um, that you can work with us to be part of this program. And we really hope that um, you'll, again, email any questions to us that uh, we can help you uh, navigate this process. And as it notes there, our regular decision deadline is by midnight, 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on January 12th, 2021. So thank you again so much, and I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day, whatever time of day it is around the world. Um, and we really appreciate you joining us today. So thank you.